quickly just want to introduce myself to anyone out there who is unaware of Digital Remedy or myself. Uh, I'm Jeff D. Simone. I am the Director of Media Planning at Digital Remedy. I've been in media for about 10 years, everything from pre-sale, post-sale to the creative side. I've worked at some digital consultancies in between. So really trying to understand that full funnel approach um, with media, with marketing, with creative, really driving people um, completely down that funnel from top to a conversion when needed. Um, and really excited to have this conversation. Uh, but the star of the show today is Junior Reyes. So I don't want to speak too much on his behalf. I'd love to have him introduce himself. Hey, how are you all? My name is Junior and I'm the Senior Program Manager at Resident, focused on linear TV and connected TV buying. Um, prior to this, I was uh, managing all of our programmatic and YouTube media here. Uh, and yeah, I've been with the company for almost five years now. We started where it's like forever, but it's been a great ride and I'm excited for this conversation. Awesome. Likewise. So appreciate the introduction. Appreciate anyone out there joining us and brand innovators for having us today. Um, so to just jump right in, you know, I want to make sure this does become CTV OTT focused, but just want to touch on some general data deprivation questions right out of the gate. So, you know, we know that a lot of people feel that there's just too much data privacy concerns out there. From any survey you look up, there's people that just feel like too much data about them is readily available and that data that they had access to wasn't really being used to the best of the advertiser's advantages. They didn't feel those opportunities were really curated for them. And then you really saw, you know, this trickle down effect happening all the way back with the EU implementing GDPR, at what feels like it's been five, six, seven years now, um, time's moving really fast. And then about three-ish years ago, you saw that kind of touchdown in the US with GDPR and California. So, you know, it's kind of felt like up to that point still, what's the ramifications of this? And then the real hammer dropped when Apple came into play with the iOS 14 update that as everyone's seen, you know, you get those ask app to allow tracking or not. Uh, more times than not, people have opted out of that. And that has kind of caused this waterfall effect um, that's begun. And then as we're seeing Google starting to take that next step um, with them eliminating cookies on their Chrome browsers, uh, but that continues to get pushbacks. So we'll get into that a little bit. But really, um, right out of the jump, do you think there's an underlying reason why Google keeps delaying this date? It was initially supposed to happen by now. Now it's saying not until 2024. Is there kind of something underlying here that we should be on the outlook for? Um, in my opinion, personally, I think it's just the fact that, quote unquote, a better solution hasn't sort of risen yet uh, from all the rumble that's happened over the last five or six years around privacy. Um, and I think that um, given how much of the, it's called the World Wide Web, right? Um, Google observes, right? The cookie is very valuable to them, right? And even if you think about the alternative solution like trade that's right now pushing for the unified E2.0, um, it's something that in theory sounds great, but in reality it's just, in my opinion, another cookie. Um, and it's something that is slowly taking traction and adaption. You know, recently, I believe AWS recently adopted it a little bit. But in reality, uh, it also has its own sort of issues and conflicts uh, in the way that it's handled and managed and the maintenance that it needs in order for you to properly, you know, keep sort of the record of someone tied to any other sort of metadata, no pun intended, in terms of like, if you have this sort of unified, the, how do you, you know, maintain that connection throughout to like metadata about where they are, what type of consumer they are and sort of what type of targeted audience they live on, right? Because of just how that technology works, it's too much maintenance. And I know some people don't have the resources and some publishers don't have the resources to be able to implement something like that. So I feel like until then, I think Google's gonna continue to ride this web. And if I were to guess, I think that their solution is likely gonna have something to do with Chrome. They are. It is the biggest browser out there uh, on both mobile and non-desktop, um, and by a long shot. So Chrome is definitely, in my opinion, going to be the key for what the next sort of identifier will be. And I think it's something that the rest of the industry is probably going to jump on as well. So. Awesome. Yeah, I tend to go back and forth myself on, are they looking out for you know advertisers out there? Because I know a lot of people are trying to push like, 
oh, contextual 2.0 is going to be different than what you knew contextual as and it first came about to replace the cookie. And, you know, we all know it as not really a down funnel uh, tactic that's been successful for a lot of people. And on the other hand, I'm thinking, you know, is Google just planning on rolling out their own solution that's just going to end up benefiting them in the end? So it could go either way. This could get pushed back to 2026. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens. But every time it seems like it's approaching, we get bought more time there. Um, and just quickly, as I kind of reference contextual, are you under that same impression? I know that was the big thing that when these these solutions were getting brought up, that's what's going to replace that cookie technology. What's going to help us really identify the right people? Contextual keeps getting brought up. It keeps getting repackaged as this new, sexy, updated version of what we knew contextual as. Are you buying that, you know, this updated contextual targeting offering that these brands are pushing are really going to be any different in the effectiveness they have to drive those down funnel actions? I think it's all perspective, right? And who you're talking to in terms of what contextual means to them. Yeah. Um, for us, primarily uh, across all of our channels, we mainly focus on broad and do and do focus a lot of our time on the creative and let the creative do most of the talking as well as the product. Um, I think that's like the best combination in my opinion. Uh, contextual could work depending on what it is, right? Like if we're talking about contextual targeting across the web, right? Through native ads, that could potentially work for some brands, right? If you're talking about a brand that focuses on supplements and you have tons of websites that review supplement side, yes, it might be beneficial for that brand to create a better experience for the consumer in targeting in a native way that user while they're reading on those sort of content sites, right? Versus the bombarding that we experience right now with this play across the, the open web, right? Contextual on Facebook is a non-existent thing in my opinion, because uh, it's a discovery platform, right? You're there scrolling and trying to enjoy your day and you're getting bombarded with ads, right? It works because it's a highly clickable environment, right? So I think it just varies on the definition of what contextual means to somebody in the platform that they're thinking about applying it. Um, but for me right now, I think broad and focusing on your creative alongside ensuring that when the consumer lands on your website, they have the best experience, your product is very well explained and they know the value they're going to get out of it. I think that's just a key. Awesome. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. Um, my one concern is really just if, if it's your first touch point, it's probably not going to be at least your conversion. When I think of it replacing like these pixel lookalike audiences off, off cookie data, there's a chance that the first time they click through your site, they might convert. Contextual, it's really just to get them in your funnel and then yeah. capitalize on some of your first party data that you then can aggregate from there to complete that purchase cycle. So mm -hmm. definitely not saying it can't be effective, but just thinking more so if I have one touch point to hit you with and make it memorable, I don't know if it's going to have that same impact that we've seen with this, this cookie-less history, I guess we can call it now, or cookie yeah. class. Um, and just on the topic of, of data deprivation, um, and certain platforms we're talking back and forth. Do you see a certain platform or platforms or mediums that are going to reap the benefits of these changes? Yeah, absolutely. I think that linear and connected TV, in my opinion, are two of those platforms, right? We think about back when mobile advertising first came out and people realized that they can't use cookies in that environment uh, and we had to adapt the mobile ID, right? It forced, it for, it forced the publishers the apps and everybody that was working on the mobile side to rethink how to properly measure, right? Think about how Apps Liar is like the number one like measurement company for apps out there, like the way they look at things, right? Um, it's the same thing for connected TV and linear, right? Linear now has seen a shift in that a lot more of the content that you were able to buy uh, ads in between and, and, and on is getting moved to a more programmatic buying basis. Um, it's helping shift the way that measurement is done for linear TV, right? Because you have now more quote unquote digital signals, right? At the household level, right? Like IP address um, amongst other in-house devices like Roku, for example, has devices in the house where they now don't have to rely on some sort of third party device or third party identifier for them to be able to tie things together, right? So I think that, um, these are platforms that are not gonna start seeing shift also from other core channels when they're being affected by uh, data, uh, the, uh, by, by the, sorry, by the uh, lack of data um, that, that, that we're seeing in web browsers and 
also through iOS 14, et cetera, like podcast is another one, another example where brands need not to focus so much on the technicalities of an algorithm or what the algorithm uses to identify, but instead on the host or the messaging that they're going after in order for that to be more effective, right? So it really becomes more about the experience of the consumer than so much about how do we gonna perfect the perfect measurement, the perfect tracking so that we can know every point of the path, which sometimes takes away from brands focusing so much on is your ad even good enough to be in this medium or is the consumer even having the best experience possible, right? So I think some of the more traditional channels are going to start making a comeback and they have already been doing so, right? Podcast has been generating a buzz the last uh, three or four years now um, and gaining a lot of traction um, and then streaming and, uh, and connected TV, right? It's sort of like the new uh, golden ticket out there that everybody wants to take a crack at and figure out how to make it uh, one of this core channels. So yeah, I think there's it's gonna be a wave of these traditional channels reaping the benefit of some of the bigger platforms having issues with properly identifying users. Yeah, I definitely agree with all that. The traditional mediums coming back into play, but I'm glad you brought up podcasts too, because the one thing it's not podcast, but the host specifically is the is yeah. the key piece there. Cause the first thing we saw when the iOS changes happened was just a flood back into influencer media because you're not just when you lose targeting site, that's the one thing that, okay, I know this person meets my target and then they have 800,000 like-minded people behind them. And that mm -hmm. was the first real change we happened. So that very similar to me is how people are approaching the podcast. If you can't get that data programmatically or through a pixel, you just have to understand who that hero to these individuals is that micro or macro influencer mm -hmm. and just understand, you know, every one of the people that engage with them, is looking for content that looks and feels just like them, feels native to them. And that has been a huge opportunity that I've seen really take over. I mean, you're seeing the lifestyle these TikTokers are living mm -hmm. right now all from the money they're making off marketing deals. It's yeah. insane. Um, but I know you briefly touched on it. I do want to put a little bit more of a spotlight here because OTT and Connected TV is the space you play in and, and I do for the most part as well. Um, luckily, a lot of what we're doing isn't cookie based, which is a real benefit to us as far mm -hmm. as getting out ahead of that curve. You know, someone who's on the fence of seeing a lot of their digital returns not be as strong as usual, what would kind of be your positioning for them to give OTT a shot or really understand that this is the medium of the future for them based on what they're losing um, because of the deprivation of data? Yeah. Um, I think that the biggest thing is the fact that it is at a household level, right? If you're buying it correctly, you're buying it to someone that knows what they're doing and, and it's not sort of selling you a package of things that will make it seem like it's uh, something else. Uh, there is a case for many of the, the DSPs or buyers out there, or buyers out there. It is a great medium because it is in a it is one where you're cashing an engaged user in an environment where they get to see 100% of that video, right? And if you're working with a good partner, right? Uh, for example, we work with um, with Roku, and I love the fact that they have the advantage of the device in the house because it helps with sort of the triangulation point of what happens next from the device level, right? The pixels on the side, etc. Um, but it's also a medium where you can truly be creative and know that you can play with multiple parts of your creative, right? Um, on Facebook, for example, you have to focus so much on the thumb stopper and those first three seconds of that creative, which creates a lot of limitation for you when you can do it or not. It forces you to be extremely creative, <laughs> you know, I don't think that away from that. And then you think about YouTube, for example, is another video medium, um, but there, you're lacking sort of media completion rate. Right? And then you switch to something like more trendy nowadays, like TikTok, and you're dealing with churn rates of creative that it's hard to keep up with if you don't have the teams in place in house to be able to uh, reproduce and reintroduce assets into the algorithm so that they don't turn so quickly. So I think for me, the biggest advantage in the medium is the creative format. Like TV, it's a long form, right? And it's something that is watched entirely. And for me, that is worth much more than a display impression or three seconds 
on a different channel where it's likely that they're scrolling too fast. They don't get enough of the brand in order to understand that this is a brand that they want to invest time in, right? So to me, that's sort of the, the incentive of trying to make sure that I crack this channel and invest in this channel. And even when I'm talking to other people that are not part of the channel, it's also like, you want to get in there, right? Because although right now, um, you know, there's this hype around it, it's still just the tip of the iceberg for the channel, in my opinion. And we still haven't fully seen the development of the different ad formats. Like if you think about Hulu and their interactive units, right? Where now if you are connecting your device, if your connected device um, is, on, is on the same uh, Wi-Fi network as your device, right? From the screen, you can send yourself a push notification to your app or to your phone that you can quickly uh, get a link to connect to the brand, right? And I'm sure that's gonna evolve further in a more interactive and seamless way where it's gonna reward the consumer, right? If we're thinking about Netflix right now, moving into the uh, the ad space, right? That's also gonna be uh, another incentive for why you wanna get in now versus waiting until later. Netflix is by far one of the biggest uh, streaming players out there with one of, the one of the biggest reach out there. And once they get into the ad space, right? You wanna be there early rather than later on when CPMs and other things are going to be extremely competitive. One of the things about also being in early is that you get to try new things, right? Part of us getting in with Roku, what we did also is trying different beta features and things like that for interactive units and a bunch of other things. So I think it has its benefits to get in on a new marketing channel early on, similar to TikTok. TikTok is seeing also a lot of early adopters and they're seeing a lot of great benefits from the TikTok shopping ads and other type of interactive uh, units that drive performance. So I think it's just a matter of trying everything. You don't want to be confined to just your core channels. I think marketing makes that diversification is key in order to survive in the next five, well, not even five, two, two to five years, honestly, given the way things are with all these different privacy laws. I think I was just recently reading also that in 2023, we have a few more states that are joining sort of the, the, the same sort of act that California had, right? So you have Virginia, I think you have Connecticut, you have Utah. So you started, started to sort of span into the East Coast now. And soon enough, these platforms, these apps, and all these different publishers are going to have to start abiding by different set of rules they weren't before. And it's going to see, and we're going to start seeing sort of the same sort of shakedown that we saw when California did it. And, you know, Facebook experienced quite a turbulence for some time where you couldn't even retarget people over there unless you had your own first party data. So I think it's good to start thinking about diversifying your marketing mix early on. And as these new marketing channels uh, come about, I think it's good to test them earlier. I agree wholeheartedly as well. Um, the thing about, you know, more states starting to roll that out. The interesting thing is, you know, all the companies we've worked with have pretty much already just assumed as soon as California came out, they're going to treat it mm -hmm. national. If you have to do the work just to accommodate your California customer, like you might as well just take those repercussions for all other 49 states. Um, oh, 100%. The, the math right there, uh, 50 states minus California is 49. I'm right on my game. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing you did mention that I wanted to unpack a little bit more was, you know, when you look at social creatives, it's rigid, it's fast. Those churn rates are really high. When you look at OTT, the production quality is a little higher, but you can get a longer runway out of those creatives. You can get two, three, four months. Um, mm -hmm. I, I believe your company does offer creative services as well. Are those conversations you're having with a lot of your clients on justifying you know, those heightened production costs because you're going to get a longer lead time out of it? Just the nature of the medium you're playing on is a little bit more high quality. Just trying to understand how you know clients who are coming from hey, we're used to pumping out testimonial style videos to now we have to make a commercial quality uh, creative that, you know, could be in the in the five five figure mark. Yeah, so the way that we treat uh, our, and just to uh, clarify, so, and the, we have a creative studio in-house and the way that we treat our different brands, the resident has about six or seven different brands and each brand is treated differently in terms of, the value that it adds, the specs of the product, et cetera. So <clears throat> when we decided that we were gonna have that in-house, it was from the very, very start. And the reason why is mainly because as, as a marketing team, right? Having any sort of lag between 
the team that is producing the creative and the team that is buying the media and testing the ads creates a drop in performance, right? If you immediately see that an ad is uh, shining by way of looking at the trend of performance over certain different day periods, you can easily communicate with your creative team, editor, et cetera, and just sort of reiterate quickly and put it and, and put it through uh, the test pipeline right away and retest it and add something fresh. Well, oftentimes happens with different brands and a different scale, honestly, is that the marketing team, the creative team are separated. Either the creative team falls sometimes under the brand marketing team versus the performance. And even that in itself, I think is, in my opinion, not the right way of doing things, separating brand and performance. I think those two things should be together. But speaking of creative, in my opinion, the two should be tied to the head. Um, and that is the, the biggest issue that we see in terms of competitors or other brands out there is that they can produce assets at the pace that these algorithms are sharing through them. Um, and by the time they reach uh, a new asset, right, now they're picking up um, and having to make up ROAS from the time, the lifetime that they experienced in trying to get that asset. So for us, it was imperative that we have a studio in-house, we have graphic designers, uh, we have uh, video editors in-house, and everything that we needed to go from ideation to storyboard to production to execution in a matter of a week's time. And to us personally, that's been sort of the advantage because although on streaming, for example, yes, you can take a high production quality shoot and make it last longer, um, that helps, um, which, uh, <clears throat> sorry, which can last longer at the same time with that same footage, if we want to splice it and dice it because we have multiple tests, we have a video editor that is literally like right next to me and I can just chit chat and sit and show what am I targeting, um, how am I targeting and give all the context that is relevant to potentially change the intro, change the music, change the style and make that much quicker than having to go through an agency, send in a creative brief, going through the back and forth, right? Even if it's an agency that provides edits uh, for you, right? It's still a process because again, they're handling multiple clients. So. Um, to me, it's imperative to have sort of two live under the same roof um, so that you can continue to move by the pace of these algorithms um, that are showing to this grid. Got it. And then w on the topic of creative, you know, as you're making some of these creatives and you're understanding that, you know, this data deprivation is happening and it's at the IP level, you're likely playing to a little bit more of a broad audience than your one-to-one, -one. you know, maybe, maybe the, the husband in your household is who you want to reach, but just being cognizant of, there might be kids watching. There may be, you know, a wife watching. Mm -hmm. um, are there are there things you're putting back into the creative process? I think there's a huge emphasis going into creative again because of how important. Has that shifted kind of how you're approaching creative? Or are you just seeing across the board a heightened interest in your company's creative services? Because now they have to, you know, they find ha have to find more sticky creatives in place of that more one-to-one -one targeting. Yeah, so we uh, definitely have, change the way we look at creative over the years. Um, for example, on one of our brands, we sort of focus on developing characters um, based on data that we get from multiple different sources, uh, primarily first party data, which is from our own consumers by surveys, creating surveys for them uh, or post purchase surveys and trying to understand better about the consumers or better yet from our CS team where we have conversations with them trying to understand from the CS team what type of consumers they're talking to, who are these consumers, um, et cetera. So we focus on sort of creating characters in, in, in some of our brands. So for example, one of our brands, Nectar Sleep, we focus on creating this character who is, she's the head of the household, she's a mom, uh, with a couple of kids, kids into gaming, but she's the head of the household. So because she has this mattress, she's able to achieve additional uh, hobbies and activities that she can pack into her day because she's getting a good night's rest sleep, right? For example. So definitely the shift has gone from um, focusing on what we're targeting in specific audience segments to more of like, let's learn more about the consumers that we already acquire 
and then see how do we tailor the creative and see what will, will resonate more. Alternatively, is also looking at some of the adjacent sort of verticals to our to our to our space, right? So we're focused heavily on uh, where the mattress uh, mainly company is. So looking at what other competitors are doing and the uh, in their space in terms of ads can sometimes be relevant or not adjacent. So like if we are selling mattress, you know, there's companies out there selling uh, bedroom furniture, there's companies selling home furniture, overall home furniture and trying to understand what they're doing from a creative standpoint that we potentially might not be doing. Cause then that wraps up sort of the whole persona. If someone is interested in sleep, they're likely gonna be interested in some home furnishing products and trying to understand how uh, that consumer comes together from looking at multiple different brands, give you more holistic pictures, and you can sort of start incorporating some of these things into your creative, right? Like in, in our in the Nectar Mom example that we had, for example, uh, the recent one that we just released, um, uh, Nectar Mom is sort of seen uh, creating ice sculpture, you know, playing football with her kids, sort of trying out different hobbies, simply based on observations that we've seen through other adjacent verticals and you know and then that's sort of how one of the ways that we sort of go about creating some of these high production shoes but also again in general just you have to think differently about the creative in, in tv and, and to tv in general these days you know you have to be a little bit more broad anyways um and i think that helps the fact that we have the production and studio in-house awesome and just i know you know commercials and OTT have usually really been a space where it's really mainly an awareness play because of what's happening on other traditional channels, losing that visibility and uh, ability to optimize efficiently towards conversions. Are you starting to kind of change the messaging a little bit in your creatives? Is it becoming a little bit more um, value prop focused or is it still very much, you know, is it still very much an awareness play when you're going through that creative process? Uh I think we're playing around with sort of the messaging here and there, but predominantly, it, I would say, is heavily focused on the product spec and trying to sell the offer that we have, um, given just the fact that compared to our competitors, we are priced significantly better. And also, um, we're one of the pioneers in terms of offering somebody a 365 night trial to try sort of our products. Um, so we focus heavily on that. But again, it's also the perception and the reality of trying to communicate to the consumer that rather than paying for a brand that is charging you a markup in addition to their, because of their marketing, right? You're getting the same value uh, of a high-end brand for much less, but without losing on the quality. So that, that is simple to say, but it's hard to like visually explain. So. For us, we play with graphics overlays. We play with influencers, right? To also influencers as well as actual uh, consumer generated content, right? To also show that this is not just actors that we can put together on screen, but also real customers that we can put together on screen to sort of speak the message, um, help in sort of delivering them, right? So it's, it's a mix of different things. It's not just general awareness play, um, I think that for us, that never really has been a thing. It's mainly been just heavy focus on product feature, our pricing, additional, and in addition to that, our value props, which is forever warranty. And also you have 365 night trials to try our products. Awesome. That's super helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and just switching gears a little bit here uh, with political hot coming up in, in November, um, it probably won't be as much of an impact in this election, but next time, you know, we're, we're looking at primary elections again for the presidential race. Are we, are you seeing a different way to approach advertising with what's going on with data deprivation? Um, are you going to see a return to linear to believe, or you think people are going to replace, you know, segmented targeting with publisher level targeting and just go straight to direct sources like Fox News, CNN, et cetera. Um, has there just been any sort of change or thinking towards how you're gonna, your company's approaching uh, political advertising moving forward? Yeah, so that's something that, you know, is, it plays on the brand safety side and depends on what you want to, how you want to be perceived as a brand. So I think is, uh, it's a matter of 
brand, on a brand basis. I think it's gonna depend. Uh, for us, uh, linear, right? It's typically bought on a network basis. So for us, we'll continue to do that. To do that. CTV, we buy that on a PMP basis for majority of the inventory. So we select the publishers. Um, where we want to serve, and we're very selective on that, given you know the audience, the type of content that is being served on. Um, but yeah, I think for us, it's mainly going to be uh, leaning on the brand safety side, along with performance, obviously. But on the brand safety side, uh, as we get into the, the politics and elections, um, but again, not to say that we don't experiment because we have a very, a very general market consumer, right? Everybody sort of needs to sleep, so we sort of follow the performance as well. So it's just a matter of how and when, um, but for other brands out there that I'm speaking to, um, a lot of them are sort of uh, following the eyeballs. So if the eyeballs are going to be on some of these more political focus networks, that's where they are looking to be. Um, but that's my take on that. Awesome. And just as far as data tracking and targeting, you can answer this uh, in a couple of ways. So just what do you think the A, the biggest conception around connected TV and OTT is, or what's the biggest misconception right now around just data tracking and targeting that you think may be overstated by consumers? In general, I feel like consumers, although in the last five years, they've sort of learned how these companies manipulate and gather their data, I still feel that there's still some lack of, of knowledge in terms of how these data is properly used, who are the good, who are the bad apples out there, right? And you know, I know Facebook tried to do some sort of educational when they launched that sort of campaign around, around having people opt in for their stuff and trying to educate the consumer on how um, not opting in for tracking or whatever affects small business, which it does, right? So I think the misconception on the consumer side in terms of data is just that there is no good apples out there, right? That everybody's just leveraging their data and they're not getting anything in return. And I disagree with that. I think that the consumers are just not aware of what they're getting in return, right? There's the reason the internet is predominantly free uh, outside of what you pay your internet service provider, right? Um, there's a reason why Facebook or TikTok is not charging you, right? There's a reason why some brands can't afford to provide premium products. And I think that's something that sh should and needs to change in the coming years if we want consumers to be more comfortable in order to give us their data, which I don't know what the right, how or what is the right way of educating them on this, but it needs to be done. Um, and until it's done, I feel like they're always gonna be on the fence of this and we're gonna see some of those crazy percentages that uh, that have been floating out there around how many people have opt out of Facebook tracking data, for example. Um, and then as far as connected TV streaming and in terms of misconceptions there, I feel like it's just that, from my personal experience, that there's been a lack of measurement and that's true, in part it's true. There's, it's a hard medium channel to measure, um, especially if you don't have a partner that is well versed in identity and identity resolution these days. Um, so, yeah. That's yeah, super helpful. Yeah, our company, you know, we, we saw a real boom come out of that because we, we have a lot of attribution solutions in play now and we're kind of at the forefront of it, which has been super helpful. But there was one piece earlier on in your first response that I did want to dig into a little bit. I do agree. I think I think there's almost like a fear mongering that goes into people like, oh my God, they know so much about me. They know where yeah. I am. But then you're starting to see people that are, you know, they're starting to complain that they're advertisers, you know, why am I getting ads for this irrelevant mm -hmm. thing? Now? So it's like you ask for this and then you don't like the result of it. Um, and another thing you brought up that I don't think, you know, I think if people understood the impact when they showed these concerns, they would have probably backed off a little bit was just the impact this had on a lot of small businesses. Those 100%. companies that can't go out and meet a minimum of a programmatic partner or to go direct to someone and had to rely on something like a Facebook marketplace just to make ends meet. So, you know, those companies have suffered a lot. The profit and returns they were getting from those platforms before mm -hmm. iOS rolled out is completely different than now. So I do think if you kind of phrase that question in a different manner to people when taking these surveys, I think the results would be a lot different. hundred um, percent. Yeah. And I know we're, we just got a few minutes left here, but, um, 
this will be completely your opinion. Um, just something a little bit more gossipy, a little bit on my end. Um, but, you know, Apple came out looking like a hero when all of these changes happened. And then as recently as a couple months ago, you're seeing the news in stock uh, application on your iPhones and your MacBooks start to have ads come through now. So in your opinion, was, was what Apple did kind of give the power back to the people play or was it give the power back to Apple and kind of give them exceptional control over that premium first party data they have a hold of? I think it's a little bit of both. But if we're going to put Apple in a corner, I think we should put Google in a corner. Because yeah. Google is like one of the biggest first party data holes in the world, in my opinion. But also, I think that I'm not mad at Apple for doing it, honestly. Like, if there's the one thing that I know Apple, from my experience, again, <laughs> uh, can do right is create a unified and a very seamless user experience. And if there's anything that I expect them to do is make the ad environment within their ecosystem look and feel as the same that you feel when you're using an iPhone in an operating system, right? It's seamless, it's beautiful, it's, it's intuitive, like that's what I expect. And I feel like they're just sort of like, they've been playing with the India space for a bit and not, and whatnot. And I know now they're starting to hire a bunch of uh, really important heads uh, for their ad business. So hopefully that when they get to their peak, they resemble what they've been doing with the iOS ecosystem. Because then I think we'll get to a different type of advertising experience and marketing experience. Because honestly, like if you were to rate the overall advertising experience across everything right now, it's not the best. You know, if you even go on Hulu right now, you can't watch a show without getting bombarded by ads and without frequency at, at that, right? If you're scrolling through Facebook or TikTok, even TikTok right away, you like got a lot of good content. And now it's like, okay, when well, you see an ad like every three or four swipes or even, even less sometimes. So, and now you have the announcement that YouTube made on shorts where although great, right? They're gonna give more revenue to content creators who produce short videos and the qualifications for becoming uh, a short content pro, uh, uh, revenue rev share uh, content creators are lesser now. It's also gonna change that experience, right? So. I think the the companies, although focused on trying to reward the, the content creators, all these different things, are also not thinking about the consumer experience. And I think that hopefully Apple, when they get to their peak, does it differently. I agree. Um, and then just again, you mentioned kind of Netflix earlier and streaming services. It almost seems like they're just in like a lose lose situation right now because there's this expectation from a public standpoint in their stocks to add users, add users, add users. The second that stops, they have to find a new revenue stream. That revenue stream is incorporating ads. Ads are going to upset people, they're going to lose more subscribers. And it just feels like an unwinnable battle. Again, these are conglomerates. I'm sure they're doing okay. But it's just a fascinating way to think about it is, you know, the user and consumer can control so much of this from not happening. And it's just so hard to constantly continue to appease them, which makes it, they're in such a tough bind right now that I'm really interested to see what happens. I know Disney Plus is doing the same thing in December. They're rolling out their ad offering at a lower price point. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see who's going to pay that premium for the non-ad version, who's just going to bite the bullet, take the ads, and then complain about it later. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, I know we're just about as time, just looking over um, my question, if there's anything else I wanted to touch upon. Um, just if you had any, any trends or two channels to look out to, if you had to put on your magic, uh, genie hat and predict what are we going to be looking at is the place to be from an advertising standpoint in two to three years. Um, where would you kind of put your money right now on that being? Oh, you went on mute there for a second. I don't know what your mic cut out. Sorry. Um, I would, I would say it would have to be the content creators. Um, what they've achieved in the last two years has been insane. I mean, you have content creators and products in Walmart uh, and, you know, Whole Foods and multiple different products and people flocking to, to malls to, to meet them and try out their, their new things. And I think that's because, again, the content creator knows how to create an experience that the consumer will enjoy. And us as brands tend to focus so much on the performance of different platforms 
And we have so very little control of how these platforms then create an experience for the consumer. So I think that in the next two to three years, we're gonna see a lot more brands embracing content creators, bringing content creators potentially in-house to help with you know, brand strategies or creative strategies or anything around how to promote the product. Um, you know, one of the greatest to do it is Mr. Beast. Uh, he's done tremendous work in this and now he has his products at Walmart in aisles and the checkout line, like you name it, right? He's opened up his first store in the, in the American Dreams Mall here in New Jersey, right? And he had over 5,000 people flying from everywhere and coming from everywhere just to, just to buy burgers, right? So I think content creators have a lot of power um, with their audiences. And to the point that you said before, right? If you're gonna have issues with sort of identifying what the right audience is, you have a bunch of content creators out there doing that for you might as well go reach out to them and try to invest in a, in someone that is putting out great content and it's also building a great community. Because at the end of the day, you build a great community, you're gonna have loyal followers, like some of these content creators. Yeah, totally agree. A lot of what I, I found fascinating too is like just the constant need for content from consumers these days. Like <laughs> you, can't, you can't wait a week for a television show to come out anymore. Nope. You need I'm to- I'm fishing for Game of Thrones House of Cards to like just release everything. <laughs> Cause like, I can't deal with the, the anxiety of waiting every Sunday. Oh wait, I have plans. I can't watch it just when it comes out, right? Like these are things that even, uh, even as a marketer, you know that are set in stone for a reason, right? To keep the consumer like on a leash, so to speak, right? Uh, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's a high demand for, for content these days. Yeah. So like what you could have gotten, you know, let's say you're watching two hours of TV every Sunday night. Now you follow, you find your favorite 50 creators on TikTok. They make minute videos. Bam. There's your two hours filled every day in fresh content. You can't watch the same thing twice. Reruns don't matter to you anymore. It really, you know, that's something that has to be considered when, when these brands and, and mediums kind of think about the future is, you know, it's gotta be fresh. It's gotta be new. And you sometimes have these people attention spans for about six seconds. So um, again, I know we're over time by three minutes, but appreciate your time as always. Um, I'm not sure if any questions came in. I think the moderator on top of this moderator is going to come back in um, and let us know if any questions came in. But other than that, um, appreciate your time. Of course. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, so there's no questions, but I just wanted to chime in and say this is such a great conversation that covered really important topics from influencer partnerships to data usage and the effects of opting in and out to advertising content creation. It was really interesting to learn about. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today and making time out of your busy schedules to be here. And we hope to have you back on soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time as always.